So do you just want me to start? Do you want any uh, introductions or anything? OK, uh, uh, allow me to, to introduce you first, Dr. Gardner. Um, OK, OK, uh, everyone, doc, Dr. Dr. Gardner has served as the as the director of the Collegiate Employment Research Institute at Michigan State University for over 35 years, where he also held the position of executive director of career services. Um, but but uh, the main reason that that I invited Dr. Gardner to to be our guest speaker because of his research has been instrumental in shaping our understanding of new graduate labor markets, early workplace socialization, work integrated learning, and, uh, and the broader aspects of career development and student success. His insights have, have guided countless students and professionals, including me, um, in navigating their path through the complexity of today's working world. We are privileged to have Dr. Gardner share his extensive knowledge with us today, focusing on critical aspects of work integrated learning. Uh, Dr. Gardner, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Please feel free to begin your lecture. Okay, thank you very, very much. I am glad to be with you. Um, actually, I was talking to my wife today. We've, I was, I taught my first classes in Thailand uh, at Kitsetsart in 1975. I was there as uh, for two years working in uh, agricultural land reform and teaching there. Uh, so we have a long history with Thailand and I'm really glad to be here. So I'm not going to take up much time. I've already wasted a lot of your time and I apologize for that. Now, uh, if I start talking too fast, which I have a tendency to do, just start raising your hand and I'll slow down, okay? Um, so what we're gonna do today, is gonna talk uh, about, I got four parts to this talk. The first part is a short introduction to about disruptions in the workplace that impact jobs, uh, because this is the foundation rationale for developing the T professional. And then I'm going to shortly talk about how skills and competencies are and what employers kind of expect out of um, uh, as as jobs change and as technology begins to uh, encroach on different kind of jobs, uh, what the skills and competencies are, which brings us that lays the foundation to talk about this construct that we call the T professional. And I'll spend most of my time on talking about the components of the T professional and why is it, 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 it the construct is so appealing to students to understand all the things they were doing. And then in the last part about nurturing T development, I'm going to really talk about roles of those of us that are involved in uh, work integrated learning co-op uh, and you'll see throughout this areas where as you become more engaged as professionals, you, you're already engaged uh, how you fit in. So let me just quickly talk about the disruptions. There are various disruptions to the labor market uh, that impact jobs, influence the shape of work, and then it, of course impact individuals. There's enormous business cycles uh, that usually generally historically occur every four or five years, there's an adjustment in a, we call it a recession. We haven't had one um, for a long time. We've run, had about a 15 year run of pretty solid economies. Now that's speaking from the US point of view, uh, and we haven't really experienced uh, a serious recession or business adjustment. So we, we don't see that, haven't seen that very often. However, we have experienced a black swan event, which is something totally unexpected. We're not, we can't plan for it. It has different kinds of consequences that are, that could still play out many years after it. And that was the pandemic, that was COVID. Uh, certainly has changed a lot of things about uh, the labor markets. It's, it brought technology on much, much faster than we expected. Uh, at the same time, at least in, in the US, the hiring has gone uh, still been very strong for new college graduates, university graduates. 
Then there's periodic events like uh, tariffs and trade wars that are more instigated on the political side, uh, not the economic or the business side, but they they tend to have very temporary shocks to the economy. But the big one and the one we'll talk about throughout this is the advance of technology. And technology advances have um, constantly for over 200 years in some shape or form have continually impacted work structure and work processes. And they're not unfamiliar to any of them. Uh, the T construct that I told uh, we're going to focus on has its earliest antecedents in the digital advances that began in the 1990s. And that's when the, the term T began to emerge in discussions about what should the new university graduates be looking like when they enter a, a workplace that is really being shaped by technology. And of course, right now, today, we're in the midst of a uh, some big mega forces in technology, and that's AI, cognitive systems, uh, data analytics is, is plays into that, 3D printing, but the big one is a AI, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But these are the kind of events and disruptions that begin to emerge in the workplace and begin to affect us as individuals because we have to respond to them in some way. Uh, if we want to continue to be in the workplace. Now, technology, and we're going to focus on that, it's what it is, it's fast and it's constant. And what happens is, as technology increases in value, it becomes eagerly adapted by those who can, who can control it. Uh, so right now, we're in the early stages of AI, and it's coming on very fast and its value is increasing rapidly as it advances. And we're beginning to see many, many different ways it's being in, introduced and inserted in the workplace. Now, what happens when any type of technology uh, enters, the, enters uh, the workplace and a job, three, uh, several things happen. Now, a job is made up of many tasks. So when we, re we disrupt this job, uh, several things happen. First, tasks are pulled out and eliminated and totally handled by technology. And, we, and they'll always be handled with technology. There be, might be a human directing some of that, but it's all handled by technology. Then there are tasks that require new skills and they're pulled up, what we call pulled up to a higher level and they require uh, the individual in that job or the person that's going to take that uh, on those tasks to have more skills, higher level skills than were required originally. And then the third happens is we, th some of the tasks require even less skills and they're pulled down. And what happens with those that are pulled down, they go to low wage job uh, positions. Uh, they, they're handled for a while. Many of them obviously become elite obsolete and we don't do them anymore. Now, for those of us working in work integrated learning, we work across many different types of disciplines uh, and, you, and many of your disciplines are uh, technology based uh, and so they're right on the forefront of this. But every type of occupation when you leave and you work, maybe you work at a different university, um, I've just listed some examples. I've stayed away from engineering and computer science and some of those fields because they're on the forefront and they are seeing changes. But every single occupational grouping that we typically see at the at a university are going to be impacted. So you're going to have to deal with this in, in a variety of ways, not only in your own job, but with the students you're working with. And yet you're the interface with employers and you're they're going to you're going to see that uh, as they begin to adjust their jobs and what they and the kind of positions they have because you're trying to bridge that gap between the student and the employer. So you're going to see a lot of changes going on. Now this graph um, is uh, I borrowed it. It's a couple years old now. I borrowed it from it's it's popular. Uh, it appeared in this form in a book by Tom Fre Thomas Friedman, 
uh, and I put it there. But let me explain uh, where the dissidence is, and and, and it will make sense uh, a little bit later. So you look at the technology curve, and you can see that technology starts very slowly, uh, uh, changing things very slowly, and then it becomes the curves up quite sharply, and it almost becomes exponential. So it means it's growing very, very fast. But you look at the curve that shows how you and I and the people around us adapt to technology. It's it's very, very slow. Um, we often don't see the technology changes occurring until they're almost very dramatic. And you can see that um, uh, from where we were uh, right before the pandemic, you can see that that little black square says where we are. We were very far up. We were starting a very strong exponential growth in in the adoption of technologies, and we were having a we're having a very hard time keeping up. Where they pause it, we have to learn faster. We have to govern the role of technology smarter, which we haven't done. Now you inject AI in there, um, and what's happened over the last four years is that little black square has moved up the technology uh, curve even faster than we thought, and human ability has not changed very much. So that line, how we have to learn and react, is getting steeper all the time. It's, it's going to be a challenge for us, for those of us that work on the interface between university and work and trying to prepare students to handle this environment. So here's a little quote that you can remember. Um, it's paraphrased from uh, Dave Mendel's book. But if what I'm, the point of what I'm trying to make at this point is you change the technology and you change the tasks. And once you change the task, you change the nature of the work. Therefore, you change the nature of the work and you change the type of worker that has to be there. And eventually you'll change enough of the workers that you're trying to change the culture of the organization uh, that you're that they're working in because you're beginning to change the systems from a very linear system to very demanding technical systems, which are very different. So this is what's going on constantly now, uh, what we're facing. Now, at this point, if we have any questions, I don't I'm pressed for time. I've left words. If you have any questions now, I have thoughts about this point, uh, have a few things that I thought of that I might ask you uh, at this point is as you you've been working in the co-op space, have you might have seen have you seen positions begin to change that you've traditionally put your students in that have begin to change because of technology? and uh, maybe your own experience that you have prior work experience or you're working at the same time you're going uh, getting your degree here uh, that you see, witnessed technology beginning to change the way people work who's working at those organizations what employers expect is there any thought on that have any of you uh, experienced any of that OK, we'll keep, give it some thought. We might we'll come back to this when we have questions and answers. I'm going to move into this, how we deal with it, it, disruption and the focus on skills. Uh, I tried to build a story around this so it makes sense to get to the T. So I hope it doesn't frustrate, uh, get it too out of line. So the first thing is what's happening as this disruption occurs, we're going from a very orderly way to do things to a, things begin to break apart as tasks are pulled apart and it moves closer and closer to what we call chaos where everything's just kind of messed up and floating out there and has no um, order to it. And you and I as individuals don't like to deal with things that aren't orderly and practiced. We don't like uncertainty. We don't like confusion and we get highly anxious as these changes begin to occur in jobs. 
So what has to happen is you have to, we have to be in a position to kind of reset ourselves to maneuver uh, during these changes so that we can, as an individual worker, put ourselves in the best position to continue to be uh, productive and, and, have a, and have a job. So if we look at the basic skill sets, now I'm sure in your your training and your development and, and the and materials you've looked at, you have seen um, many different lists of what employers expect. I mean, there's there's lots of lists. So I'm I'm combining several different sources here. A couple of them I'll be very specific about. What I'm trying to build up to is uh, to get us to see all the factors that are involved as we and we we put them together uh, when we talk about the T. So we have basic skills that we learn across uh, all disciplines. So you've learned these early. You learn these in in elementary school and high school. You learn to listen, to speak, to write, to read, and you have basic quantitative literacy: add, subtract, uh, doing basic math. And you create, then we have thinking skills, creative reasoning, making decisions, how to solve problems, and knowing yourself how you learn best so you can continue to learn on your own. And then we have personal qualities, which often go to ignored, but this is attitudes, behaviors, values, uh, your work ethic, uh, integrity, the ability to manage yourself, uh, do I get to work on time? Do I get my assignments done on time? Uh, am I responsible for my actions? And then lastly, we have a, a set of workplace competencies that deal with resources, how you can manage and plan and allocate resources, interpersonal skills, which has to do with teamwork, uh, teaching others, leadership, then knowing systems and how systems, social, organizational, and technical systems work together and, and influence the shape of your performance and, and, and the systems you work in. And then we have technology, the ability to stay up technically literate with the types of changes that go in the workplace and maintaining those technologies. Now it's going to get more complicated as we go to AI because now we're talking about having an interface like uh, with a, a computer that's talking to us like a, a colleague, a human colleague would. We're not often, many of us, myself included, aren't quite prepared for that. Uh, we usually have control over the computer. We're putting uh, technologies that we have control over, digital not to technologies, but AI technologies are more, have require a different kind of interface, and that's going to be challenging. Now, there was a study done a number of years ago, but it's still highly quoted, and it's what we call star performers. Uh, it's It should be listed in the paper that uh, you read, but uh, Kelly and Chet Kaplan did this study of really young people in the workplace that really were what they call star performers. They excelled above everything else, and they tried to find out uh, what uh, skills and competencies that these individuals had that stood out above everybody else. And they found three critical ones, uh, mastery of one's discipline. So you have deep learning in, this, in the discipline that you've chosen to study. It could be engineering, it could be psychology, it could be art history, it doesn't, you have deep learning. And then you have developed higher order cognitive abilities. This is critical thinking. Critical thinking goes beyond the discipline. Critical thinking uh, involves crossing disciplinary boundaries, crossing organizational boundaries. It requires uh, a lot of, it challenges us to look at things differently and come up with new solutions. And then one is, the third one is a personal trait, is how you demonstrate taking initiative in the work you do, uh, seeing new opportunities uh, to improve your work, see, not without being asked, uh, things like that. It's very important. Then supporting these three are things like networking, how you get along with your coworkers, how you draw upon their expertise, expertise outside the organization, and sharing your own knowledge. Self-management, we've talked about this. It's your commitments, time, and if you can do your career planning. 
you, again, you're rep repeating some of this teamwork, leadership, followership. When you step back and let somebody else lead to accomplish uh, common goals, and then you have perspective and seeing one in a, a, your job in a larger context than just doing an assignment every day. And finally, we're going to talk about what an individual knows. And this is where um, people uh, on the interface with uh, co-op and WIOI that are working with students that are getting ready and, and introducing them to the workplace have an important role. Because as an individual maneuvers through the chaos, they have to rely on their own competencies and creating opportunities. And there's six things that they have to do. Uh, and we kind of have a uh, where, why, what kind of little thing we can remember. They have to know why, so they have to have a purpose. So first three, let me emphasize, the first three are personal. They they have to know about themselves, and the other three are what they have to know about the external world about them. And you're in a position, you're going to be kind of helping them with all six of these. What's the purpose of why I'm in, uh, pursuing the, the, the path that I've chosen? What are the values and goals about? And, and and what what I'm doing. So you asked, you know, it's not just that they select a major. They have to have something that drives them through that academic discipline. Uh, knowing whom uh, they have relationships, how to create opportunities. The not when you put them in uh, those first co-ops, it's about building relationships with their extra work supervisor, their co-workers, others can who might mentor them while they're in that experience. And knowing how this is a technical and collaborative skills that you need to perform and you're, you're helping students evaluate their abilities and what kind of skills that they need uh, and you're giving them the opportunity to reflect on those uh, and then the three industry one is do they know what where's the uh, not just an occupation or a job they may want but what about the industry they want to enter what are the interdisciplinary mobility you can go to out of a discipline into many different kind of jobs is there other pathways and other industries that might be more productive and you can guide their thinking on that then where gain confidence by knowing entry points this is again we begin to introduce students who don't have a very good knowledge of where to find jobs and how to interface with employers that you introduce them to their co-op employer and then they have it they feel more comfortable to look to other employers when it comes time to get a full-time job and then the last one is a, a, a timing one it's it's when when do you roles change and when do you have to move this comes more a little bit more by experience it's not something that as a, a young uh, university graduate is going to expect right away they we hope they don't move real quickly because uh, the choices they make may not be the best but uh, at a point they have they will have to make choices and that's something that they have to be aware of okay so what does a t model do that we're going to talk about well what's nice about everything i told you just told you about about all these skills and the different ways we have to respond uh in the workplace to advance is there are lists OK, and we give the students these lists. That's generally what we do. Here's the thing kind of skills your gen employers look for, and there may be 12 different skills and we're going to work on these. And we'll ask questions on them, but they're lists. And so what students have a tendency to do is check them off. I've done that. I'm developing that and they don't and it's very linear. So think of a, uh, a list on a piece of a rule paper rule paper it just goes down one after another but really the world we're in is nonlinear. there's feedback loops there's alternate pathways and there's got to be a, con a construct that helps students bring that together so the t professional that I, we're going to talk about is an organizing principle a framework a construct a metaphor that students and my team and I've worked with them in this space for quite a while and most of my colleagues that have find that students really grasp an understanding of this. Now some faculty might not like it as much, but they should, but uh, it allows the student to understand how their university education begins to fit together and the experiences we want them to have in work integrated learning and others integrate and support 
uh, each other as they as they participate in them and as they gain their mastery and allows them to become more nimble. <clears throat> the T model uh, that validates <clears throat> two important things. Deep disciplinary point knowledge, so that brings in the faculty that in many places don't really always support what we do. I mean, mo uh, many universities now are getting into work integrated learning. Not all the faculty buy into it for sure, but because the model embraces them uh, uh, and doesn't make it um, exter these things external to what a faculty does, we have ways to bring faculty in and gain a better understanding of what we're doing. And it also allows for across disciplinary boundaries. So it's we bring students together and you bring you can bring students from multiple disciplines together to talk because uh, the T is a way that they can connect. Now there's two important components of the T uh, that you might not always see and understand and that's what it's important. We're going to talk about systems in a kind of an interesting way and we're going to talk about the individual or what, what I call the me. Um, and so the nice thing about the T, it require you're in the nice position for this a, as an advocate for it, a, as somebody that can talk to it, to students, to faculty, because it requires top down, bottom up, inter, enter and enter thinking. So everybody should be needs to be involved in this, not one person. And and I found that the uh, my practitioners that embrace this have been able to expand the support for students uh, in their in their work integrated learning experiences and at the same time students get more out of them okay now uh, I do have some questions here uh, just for you to think about uh, and then we can bring them up at the end um, I'm particularly interested in what skills and competencies you see in your work with employers and students as critical to the success of a W uh, work integrated learning student in Thailand. I mean, what skills are you seeing that are really, really being asked by the employers uh, of the student either to have as they enter the internship uh, the co-op experience or what they gain throughout the co-op experience. Um, and and again, the important thing is uh, in, is your, in your position, how do you shift from just presenting students with a list of things into more an integrative kind of approach and a mindset where you begin to get students to think uh, uh, about how what they're doing, not in the, only in the classroom and WOI, external to work uh, and clubs they may be in part of and how those all integrate to help each other. OK, so if you if you want, I can move on from that and we'll catch up here. So I'm going to talk about the T. This is the main part. So the the T construct um, de comprises depth, which is disciplinary and system knowledge with breadth which is multidisciplinary interaction, system interaction, and boundary spanning skills. And the whole thing is conducted by the, the me. And um, I think this is, I, I, I've retired from MSU, so the Institute webpage is still there. This is an early monograph uh, there. I have also a, a book that was cited in there that came out uh, just a, a year and a half ago, two years ago now. Uh, on the T uh, that you certainly can call upon and you're going to have these slides available to help you too if you but if you need more information. OK. Whoops. OK, so this is the T. I you've seen this in the article uh, that I shared with you. Uh, this we're going to break this apart and then put it to bed together. A lot of people like to look at this at one piece at a time. It doesn't work that way. It, the reason the construct work is it all brings everything together. Uh, it just shows you how they're interrelated. It's complex. Now, if you really are excited about this and you get into it over time, um, 
a lot of people have added things to it. There's they they get their own thing, the favorite thing, and they'll add something, a depth in something, or they'll add uh, another uh, uh, breadth requirement. Uh, you can it's, they look like combs and all kinds of things. Now we're going to take real basic. Now this the T was developed in the early the concept came out in the early 1990s and IBM jumped on this uh, a good friend of mine at IBM and um, they began with a simple T depth the two depth requirements and then just uh, uh, some breadth uh, skills um, and then uh, they brought because of the work I was doing they brought we I partnered with IBM and I brought the me part to this because as undergraduates you need a strong me and this now has developed into the core fundamental T so you may see variations on this you certainly will um, and but we're going to stick with this okay so we're going to go through I'm going to break the parts down I'm going to go through each one briefly so we know what they're talking about so deep in is discipline this is where you pick you develop analytical thinking in your discipline regardless of what it is and you and your problem solving skills uh, problem solving is very disciplinary based history has a way of problem solving economics has a way of problem solving engineering uh, they all have some basic fundamental uh, components but they have all uh, problem solving is very disciplinary so there's content knowledge in um, this is what you the context you learn there's psychomotor abilities in some disciplines and then there's the effective uh, which is the um, emotional uh, parts uh, of the discipline um, it's it's the domain of a deep disciplinary knowledge is a domain of knowledge it's held by all professionals in that discipline as well as you can have specialized sub disciplines and it cut and so that's this is on the very much on the academic side um, when you're in deep disciplinary learning it goes way beyond community facts is your ability uh, to demonstrate the capacity to gather analyze and synthesize and communicate data in the way that it's done in your discipline the ability to seek new meaning as additional data comes in uh, and you synthesize it you begin to see new meaning and what you, you find out and solve those problems you reflect on learning and how to better learn in the discipline and you create new disciplinary concepts and knowledge this is what goes on in, in that deep disciplinary learning deep systems is something that we don't often think about and we don't really bring it up very much an undergraduate education. Now, that's that's kind of a glib statement because we do talk about systems. Um, depending on your academic, they always talk about systems. We don't talk it about it in the way it approaches work. We do, we don't think about what it means to navigate and uh, work in systems. But this is we have to start thinking in systems now. In the paper I said uh, wrote. I'm not sure, but uh, all this is there. But what we we drew on Meadows and Arnold and Wade. They're two really early purple people in system thinking. Uh, Meadows was more environmental side. Uh, but what we're thinking about here is the complexity of the systems we have to work in. And how to learn uh, the system we're working in. It's it's there's intra connections within and then there's inner system complexity as it connects with other systems okay so what we have to make it more uh, concrete it's the interactions between physical biological economic financial social organizational and political processes uh, and that's in 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 real life uh, and our day-to-day -day life um, and it, it, so we're dealing with resources and flows and the variables uh, that happen 
as we work in a system to either advance that system, solve problems in that system, undo bottlenecks in that system, uh, it's very important. Now, that's very nebulous and doesn't make a lot of sense to most of us. If I talk to a lot of undergraduates about systems, they kind of roll their eye and think they're going to get another physics lecture or something like that. So we had IBM came up with a really cool way of trying to tell just average undergraduate students and professionals what they really mean by systems, OK? And, and what they did was they looked at our lives and how we and what the systems we interacted with and they came up with 13 systems that affect uh, individual every day. Now this is very Western centric, it's U US, but, and so you're gonna have to, I think, make some construct changes for Thailand. Uh, some of it will be, most of it will be very similar. I think the one I'm not sure about is governing. But what they did was, if we look at our lives, there's, a, there's certain, flows of things that impact it. So transportation and supply chain, getting from point A to point B, getting uh, goods from point A to B, getting inputs from good point A to B. Then there's water to live uh, to live on and waste recycling, food and product uh, production. So it could be food, but it can also be cars energy and the electric grid and of course 5bm really big is and it's become huge now is information uh and the cloud uh as is big flows as and we now depend on big information flows then there's the ones that are human human activities and development very familiar building and construction retail hospitality and media entertainment tourism is as a group banking and finance, business and consulting, and then you have healthcare and family life, and then you have education, which would include our work in WIL uh, and entrepreneurship. And then they have government, and in the US it's city, state, regional, and nation. Um, and so this is, if you, what we want here is students to pick a system that they really want to work in. Uh, and begin to learn that system. The system is harder to learn than the discipline because it's so complex and it takes a lot of time to work in, uh, and exposure to that system. And what happens is a lot of students bounce around uh, and not think about that. So they'll take a, 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 a co-op in one system and then the next co-op in another, and that might help them eliminate or find a favorite system they want to work in, but it doesn't give them a lot of depth of understanding before they get into the world of work. Uh, some of these, like finance, uh, out of the discipline will get a better understanding of the workplace, maybe, uh, and, and some might not. But what we want to do is have students invest a, a time in learning the system that they want to be in. And this has been a real challenge. Uh, Michigan State, we did a big study and we found out all these systems were talked about on campus somewhere. But none of the people talking about them were group, were, were, were linked together. Uh, it would be one way over on one side of campus in one department talking about water and another one at another part of campus talking about uh, water re uh, recycling or something else. And we didn't we try we've been trying to develop collaboration across these systems uh so we said a, a big one another big example of how just we have all these health care health disciplines and schools and they don't always talk to each other yet they're in the same system and their students don't often understand that they're going to be working with people from these other systems i hope this makes sense because this this tries to clarify this system thing. Now we're going to switch from the depth part to the to the discipline part, uh, the breadth part across the top. So we have many disciplines. This is about interdisciplinary breadth, and what it isn't, and the is not team teaching in a class. At least the way 
I was introduced to it and actually uh, in my early days did it. So if I was an economist and I was co-teaching a class, it didn't matter who it was. It could be an environmental science. It could be uh, anything. What we do is we get I get together with the other instructor. We divide the class in half and I teach my part first. Then he or she would come in and teach their part. That's not really interdisciplinary. This interdisciplinary connections. What we want is to te uh, if it's going to be multidisciplinary to uh, house those structures at the same time and be there for every class period, sharing different how they're, they're different uh, exp uh, input uh, knowledge that's being given out by economists may agree with or disconnect or be looked at differently by the other discipline. So what we're really leading up to is we want to create a, a lot of air, uh, events, opportunities, platforms, safe spaces to have truly interdisciplinary conversations. And if you're going to do what we're really trying to do is dock down some of the silos. Now, I'm in a very large, large research university, and our silos are very, very, very high. And they're hard to knock down. We've made some inroads in some parts of campus, but not in others. It takes a long time to change mindsets uh, about. So one of my big challenges anytime I have interactions is with history, because history doesn't always view economists uh, in a kind light. Uh, they think we're kind of soft. We don't have uh, a, a good handle on what's going on. We change our models all the time, uh, but uh, the mindsets that we bring, if we don't relax them and, and open up, it just becomes brings a lot of tension. And if you're going to do interdiscipl good interdisciplinary work, it takes time and patience as these mindsets change. We are not going to talk about uh, inter with multidisciplinary system or more systems because it takes so long to learn one. Your second system will come later uh, as you've gained more professional experience in the workplace. So it gets very confusing to add multiple systems right away to for a, a typical undergraduate student. Uh, we find that there are some that immediately see the interactions and can deal with more. But we need to spend more time on these kind of competencies, what we call the boundary spanning ones. These are the ones that allow you uh, an individual to expand beyond uh, the um, to link externally and internally uh, within an organization so they can both gather information from the outside that may not be available to you. They can train you can transfer information to the outside. So it really requires, uh, it allows these skills and companies that make up the boundary spanning that are many. They, you, you saw the list there, teamwork, uh, critical thinking, global understanding, project management. Uh, all these kind of skill sets go together uh, to allow an individual to span these abilities. The challenge is that it requires activities in multiple contexts where learning can be practiced and extended and learned. The classroom is no longer necessary and it's not sufficient. Um, that's why what you do is so critically important because it gives this, this multiple con uh, uh, additional context where they can a student can begin practicing these skills and competencies. They be considered interacting and they can then come back to the campus in a safe space and evaluate what they're doing. And the other thing that's really important about um, the boundary spanning, it now brings in attitudes, behaviors, and values, which we'll clarify in a moment. So uh, the T really focuses on these boundary spanning. They, it's about developing partnerships and collaboration by building sustainable relationships, managing influences and negotiation, and seeking to understand motives, roles, and responsibilities. This is a challenge. Uh, students uh, tend to have developed skills like teamwork, but they really haven't understand how to put them in, the, in, a, in a breadth kind of context. They just figure that they've worked in a team, and, and that's the extent of it. 
OK. Now I'm through the major portions of the tea. Uh, does anybody have any questions at this point? Is anything I'm frustrated? completely confused you about do you want me to clarify okay we're going to go on to the me uh i'll take a little bit of time here on the me okay so there's three parts to the me and we use the me and it's the individual there's purpose awareness and confidence so purpose is the definition we use is something that's that a person has found something that's meaningful for them to do to accomplish and it it has consequences outside of themselves beyond themselves so a purpose of just to make money which some people do isn't quite what we're talking about if they can make money if they if they're going to do something with it beyond themselves uh, more of us do a job, uh, find something meaningful in the work uh, because I want to pursue a career in higher education so that I could help future students. I wanted to teach. Awareness is about the knowledge and understanding of others, knowledge of one's capabilities. Do I know my strengths and weaknesses? Do I know my way of how I learn best and understand? Do I recognize how important others are? Uh, do I value diversity and what it brings to the workplace? So that's awareness. Confidence is the ability to take risks. Are we willing to make mistakes, seeing that mistakes are going to happen and they're necessary uh, to uh, success? Are we have the confidence to, to learn from those? Do we, can we break? Can we, are we have confidence to go beyond our comfort zone in a way, embrace uh, new, new things, new experiences? And most important with confidence, can we deal with this ambiguity that we're going to find in our careers as jobs get torn apart and put back together? Now, for you to look at this, we created this Venn diagram. And so we put purpose, confidence together, and there's six parts of this that are really critically important. <clears throat> there's the big parts of, of confidence that don't overlap and awareness purpose a lot of that what happens in their own personal growth personal reflection they can take guidance from others but it's it's learning on your own but where they intersect uh is where it requires input and help and assistance uh from others so confidence and awareness uh where they intersect it's about learning from others adapting to differences and working with others uh and as coaches in WI, we can talk about how they learn differently uh, in the workplace than they did maybe in the classroom. How did they learn from others? Uh, and, and how did it take place on campus versus in the workplace? You get to moderate this. Same way with purpose and awareness, understanding differences, how to work as a team, mobilizing resources, and then again, purpose and confidence. So this begins to put the pieces together in a way that are meaningful. So if we look at awareness, it's it, it's kind of goes uh, along these lines of how I know my purpose fits in the world. I begin to diverse inputs, enhance and insights and impacts that will I'm aware of them that are going to influence uh, how I shape my purpose and what I need to develop there. Uh, they they. It's seeking out different perspectives and knowledge bases and ability to, uh, to uh, understand your strengths and what complements each other. And what I have to draw upon from others, which I'm not particularly good at to achieve my purpose. Confidence follows a similar way. I can contribute, I can take risks. And what, what success can I follow from when I, when I fail? How do I grow? Uh, Skills and abilities is key of oneself and how I contribute and bolsters to others, and that leads to purpose. My dreams and aspirations, the values and experiences and skills that are needed, and what I need, and 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 to know how I have to what I have to do to achieve that. Uh, this is kind of a 
the colleague and I that developed this, she was co a really cool colleague. She kind of was a dreamy sort, so she did the a lot of the framed a lot of the purpose, and she gets kind of dreamy. We you, what what we really getting down is: Do you have a direction you want to go, in, and do you have a plan to get there? Passion is fine, but passion usually doesn't come with a plan, and that's where the young people fall apart. They they because they trying to follow their passion and, and they, without any plan or any structure around it, they run into problems. So our purpose means that you've got a plan, that you sit down with your co-op advisor based on the work you spent. What is the purpose of following this uh, work integrated learning experience? How does it uh, help me advance my understanding of what my purpose is? How does it connect? So you have a voice in trying to help students do that. Now, to make this useful for practitioners, what we did is we put in statements that an individual would ask in each of these intersections. And what you do uh, with these is you convert these into questions to them when they when you're doing the reflection part of that work integrated learning experience when they come when you may be uh, talking to them in the at, at visiting them on site uh, during their experience or maybe when they come back and they're working on their uh, presentation or however you conclude a working experience in, in the institution you're at uh, but you get to ask these questions so they're worded so that if I'm the the, the me person uh, I felt I, you know, take confidence from her. How I can I can contribute. That's what I want to say. But you want to say, how did you contribute uh, to the team you were on during that uh, experience? How did you take action while you were in that experience uh, that made me not directly part of what your day to day assignments were? Did you take any risks while you were in there? Or did you fail? And so you, we have all these questions, uh, and we put them, some of them, in here, so you as a practitioner can see uh, what should be going through the mind of the student, and you can frame these questions because they won't often think of these things themselves. And we do a lot of unpack. We call it unpacking when they come back. We lead them through exercises around these three uh, areas, and sit them around, and we we we. We get them to talk about what they did uh, without any guidance, and then we begin to ask these kind of turn these questions around so we get at their purpose come and then they can walk away uh, understanding, OK, what we did, how it fits and, and how it makes a T. So. Again, if there's this is really important, uh, it's it's not something that happens uh, one person does we have a lot of people that get involved in this space but uh, this is the key for most uh, what I think for most practitioners that you uh, interact with so they'd be in the career space in the work integrated learning space in the academic advising space uh, there are a lot of colleagues that you can actually bring together and and help and provide this insight to them and they can be asking the same questions too so the students begin to be reinforced uh, and on these ideas and so it becomes important to them okay i'm going to finish up here i'm going to run out of time i've probably gone over your time now this is more a role of what you as a practitioner or somebody that wants to be is it going to be a professional that are going to be guiding students um, I think uh, there's uh, some things that will ha you bring to the table uh, that allow you to take uh, to do some really cool things. One, uh, to develop a T, and if we're going to have it go to a T mindset, we have to be intentional. First place, you can't assume somebody else is going to do it. You got to, you've got to, you as a practice, you've got to make a commitment to it. And if it's only you, start with only you. But what it ha what we really want to do is it has to be intentional across campus. So you may have to educate your faculty colleagues and your other colleagues to understand what you're trying to do if you do take on the T as a part of 
of in, uh, developing uh, student preparedness uh, to, to enter the workforce. You have to be innovative. You have to look at help uh, faculty with curriculum and ideas they can put in their curriculum to advance parts of the T, uh, how they re you can create your own learning environments because most of you will do some teaching at times. What is your learning environment going to look like? How can it be innovative to bring in some of these T concepts so they, they feel like a T in the classroom? And how are you going to shape those uh, WIL experiences? Uh, are there in, in innovative ways to work with employers to uh, make sure that the assignments uh, embrace the T concept? And then what you really have to do, because you're in the central place between all these different actors, uh, and you're the bridge between the student and the employer, between the faculty and the employer, and the employer and the student, and the employer and back into the faculty, is you have to help students integrate these experiences and integrate constantly. In the US, we don't don't do a lot of integration. It's sporadic and then and the students rush in at the very end. They're going to graduate and we try to help integrate and it's really hard to go back. Four years and then have them rebuild and and try to I integrate. Uh, we aren't really good at most of us aren't good at that. So it, integration is a practice. Uh, it's a model and we have to do it continually. We have to start integrating students into WIL before they even uh, ha are in a position to actually take advantage of w, uh, WIL. The biggest challenge and assignment for practitioners uh, in our space is the ability to help students tell their story. It requires narrative assessments. We do a lot of um, pre and post assessments where they check out uh, how well you think you developed the skill uh, and they give a scale. No, what we're talking about is can you develop a story around what you did and frame it as a T story? And we aren't doing enough narrative assessments. And so students have a very difficult time really having a story when they graduate. They can talk about things they've done, but not a story. And so that's becoming important. Um, What's going to happen as uh, we move forward, particularly the you know, I, as this work decomposes, we're going to become very craft oriented. Um, a lot of craft work is gone today, but what we're seeing is through AI and other technologies, an individual student can tailor and customize what they do. And this can be a thrilling and inspiring, but it takes uh, a lot of confidence. This isn't just entrepreneurship again. And so you're going to. And so what you're going to be seeing is working with students uh, that want to craft something and tailor something uh, that may not be. Uh, the normal kind of positions that students get. And so as a practitioner, you begin to help them craft that again by putting these things this T concept out there so they can craft around that and see why it's important. Uh, standardization is widely embraced. It's still embraced. This is the most fearful thing in the workplace because technology solutions break apart standardization and routine work. Um, and 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 if we get we have we often get locked in stand we want to be standardized it's we feel safe in that but it's really really changing and it's um and technical solutions to routine work and handing heavy flows of information is really going to change the way we do and both you and i have to understand it's going to affect our jobs ai is already affecting the wil space in in the US on how employers and students interact, uh, what's expected. We expect some real uh, opportunities and challenges to arrive over the next three or four years as AI is really taking off. Um, 
we're going to have to externalize what we do. We're going to I don't know about how much is going on online. We just don't have enough people uh, to work with all the students and the non specialist. Uh, so we're going to have to externalize all the way we do things. And have some commons to share our resources and train and reuse because we just can't uh, do it all. So that's going to be one of the things that you'll be doing is trying to be you're you're a coach uh, you're a, a a learner you're also a teacher and you've got uh, to many different kind of people and you've got to act, be able to externalize it in a way that it's available to everybody uh, and that's going to be that's becoming again it sounds easy when we can put it online and we can put it on websites and we can do TikToks and we can do things like that and that's great but it's got to be integrated. It's got to be holistic. And a lot of the stuff is we do right now is just reaction to an issue that comes up and we put out a quick uh, video or something for for to use and, and that's not sufficient. Um, let me see. OK, this I wanted to see. So as I finish up, your jobs are going to change. I mean, you don't know that now. You're just getting started. But we're going to see that I said routine works is going uh, away. We're seeing more and more gatekeepers being bypassed. Um, back would be by bypassed. Actually, some of our career advisors are being bypassed as now employers can talk directly to students. Um, so but at the same time, uh, we get to expand our networks to much broader through using a technology. We can gain with colleagues not only in Thailand, but in other places in Southeast Asia and, the, and around the world. Uh, we can also connect with employers. Uh, I'm not sure where all your uh, students go. I'm, I would suppose, you know, most of them will stay in, and work in organizations in Thailand, but I wouldn't imagine you send students to New Zealand and Australia and and other countries. Uh, um, and uh, you're going to have opportunities to do that. You're going to be much more proactive if you follow the T than reactive and waiting for students to come to you. You're going to have to get. Uh, what we do is we found we put out the T in places on campus. Students began to to initiate their own actions and that's what we want rather than we waiting to their senior year to come to us um so we incur i encourage you to, to think about the tea even in your personal life if you can deal with that it, it, it's just a way to reduce anxiety because it allows you to engage in your own work uh, a little bit more holistically so uh with that i was supposed to leave time for questions and i don't know if uh, if I was so late that I probably messed you all up, but um, you got up very early this morning to do this, so you probably want a break. But I see most of you are at home, so you didn't have to come to campus. So, so are there are any any thoughts or any calling? It's up to you now. Uh, I've thrown out some questions. Um, Maybe one is we've just talked about the T a lot. And have you seen any of the components of the T uh, in your univ own university education? Or are you seeing any components of the T being emphasized uh, in the universities you're at? Um, I mean, it's the pieces are all there. This is nothing mind bogglingly new. It's just been put together in a way that for many of us makes sense. Um, so I thought maybe you'd have some thoughts, so don't be afraid. I unfortunately my tie I've lost has many years ago wound, lost all my ability to speak Thai, which I could do at one time. And also, I'd like to know how would you like to follow up on this? Are there more if you want to ask? You can send me questions. Um, or you can send me, you know, if you have feedback you want. Oh, there's somebody that has their hand up. Go ahead.
Thank you so Thank much, you so um, Professor Gartner, for your um, great uh, presentation um, this morning. Uh, uh, before I um, talk something, I just want to um, say sorry too because I have a call this morning, so my uh, voice is uh, not so good. <laughs> um, your presentation has uh, has caught um, has caught my feeling because of your uh, great knowledge uh, sharing with us, um, especially about uh, the T model, um, a T uh, professional model. So um, this model, as I have uh, observed, uh, emphasizes the importance of interdisciplinary uh, knowledge, boundary bridging, discipline depth, system mastery, and uh, individual growth. And also, uh, I have uh, taken note about um, the influence of uh, technology uh, and unforeseen events. Um, you were uh, mentioned something about um, the COVID-19. So uh, here, uh, technology has uh, significantly transformed uh, various occupations uh, and uh, uh, unforeseen even like the COVID-19 pandemic uh, have like uh, disrupted uh, uh, traditional work environments, uh, traditional works of learning or something. And uh, as uh, we already know, um, these uh, changes underscore the need uh, for adaptability and uh, in uh, workforce. Um, uh, for this uh, point, I, I have uh, uh, two questions, uh, two questions. Um, the first question is that, uh, uh, Professor, can you uh, tell me uh, uh, some more thing about uh, advantages and disadvantages of uh, uh, AI advancement uh, or technology advancement? And another question is that uh, can people nowadays uh, live uh, without technology? Thank you. Okay, so the first question is, uh, the advantages and disadvantages of, uh, well, it was AI, but then you said technology. Um, you know, I have to admit, if we're going to specifically ask a question about AI, I'm just learning about AI. I mean, it's it's new to me, um, and I think uh, it's a little, we're not, it's a little early yet uh, to, to, to know exactly all the implications. Uh, I have colleagues that ha are in the front of this and they say it's changing very, very fast as these AI uh, systems learn more and more. But then it, so the advantages of AI, it, they simplify a lot of some tasks. And then there's other tasks that they don't, they do, but it's it's not very good. So I'll give you an example. Suppose um, I'm teaching a class and I want my students to know how to use chat GPT as a form of AI. And so I give I, I ask them to take uh, I'm in a work integrated learning experience. So I I take them to say um, take one problem or assignment that you would have in that job and I want you to write out how you would do that task. And then then I want you to ask how ask chat GPT to do it and then you're going to compare it. What's interesting is if I just looked at yours and I only you're the only student I looked at, uh, you would see that uh, there wasn't there might not be a lot of difference between but your, your the your presentation and the AI presentation, but the AI presentation would use uh, maybe some more sophisticated word choices. It would make uh, it sound a little better. But then if I read everybody in the class and they even though they ask different questions, AI right now practically gives the same type of uh, writing back for everybody. Uh, it, it's it's very common based. So that's the, the right now the AI is just based on average of what they know. And so uh, it, it it doesn't differentiate uh, 
style very well. On the other hand, it does searches in some ways better, though not doesn't mean that the companies that are putting it on there, like Google and stuff, are uh, letting you see everything. But um, and there's there's certain things it does well. Um, in my space and the on the college recruiting side, we're seeing more and more applications of AI to review resumes uh, differently, to match employers with with graduating students. We have um, we don't know how it, there, there's a, just a lot of jobs that are like uh, matching uh, resumes with uh, position requirements. Uh, and things that are, are changing how HR specialists in the recruiting space work and how they interface with campus. Uh, and so um, we're, um, so we don't know what the implications are. I'm hedging here because we just don't know. What happens is early on, technology comes in, it has a minimal impact. And as I said, it's increase in value, it takes on a bigger and bigger role. And we're just at the early adoption stages of AI. They're making inroads, some places stronger than others. And again, we don't have a lot of guardrails around it, so we don't know what the implications are. I, I'm trying to keep up and we have discussions every couple of weeks with some people about it, but we're just kind of stepping into a, a, a no man's land. Now, could you do me a favor and repeat your second question again? Thank you, Professor Gardner. Um, my second question is about, uh, about a technology. I asked the question, uh, can people live uh, without technology this day and why? Oh, I. Can you get away without any technology? I, I think it's going to get harder and harder. I can't, off the top of my head, I can't think of many jobs unless they're very manually oriented, uh, like uh, somebody that's doing landscaping or something. Uh, they have tools, uh, but they don't necessarily use the kind of technology I think we're talking about. But I think over time, we're going to have robots doing some of that work. Uh, that um, work uh, that right now doesn't see a lot of technology in agriculture uh, harvesting. So you're right. I think there there may be some positions that can be unaffected by technology, but I think my friends at IBM tell me there is not one occupation that we have that will not in some way be impacted by technology within the next decade. So I'm just assuming that if I was out working with all, all kinds of individuals as they tried to adjust, I was gonna tell them you're gonna have to deal with some level of technology. You're just not gonna be able to escape it. Does that help? Thank you, Professor. Uh, I, I just con want to continue my talking a little bit uh, about uh, technology. Uh, for me, I think it is very important. Uh, you know, uh, when I uh, cannot uh, like uh, uh, go on to uh, Google, uh, I cannot use uh, my uh, like uh, uh, tablet or I cannot use my uh, laptop. I feel that uh, like I am dead. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions or comments from the student? Well, I want to thank you okay. for being so patient with me and my pro my technical problem and your in your morning disruptions. Yes, we have somebody else. Yes, ma'am. Mm. For me, uh, talk about the AI due to the increasing role of the AI in the world right now. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think certain field of students uh, of the study in uh, will be fed out or will there be 
like additional of the new aspect in the field or whatever in like I mean the faculty in the university or some um, some some main I mean major or something like that. You mean in AI? You want a discipline in AI? Is that what you're asking? Will there be a college discipline in AI? I'm not quite sure what you want me okay. to. Okay, I mean today's um, the the AI uh, the increasing of the AI. Yes. And uh, some of the the some of the the major something like that something the major that will be fed out or uh additional of the technology for the for the world i mean uh, um, let me see if i i'm not sure i have it exactly right but it, the rise of ai it probably won't eliminate disciplines and and but maybe i can jump ahead had this discussion um I've been telling students, regardless of what discipline they're in, AI isn't going to take your job, okay, in the job you want. But who's going to take your job is the person that knows how to use chat or AI better than you do. So that everywhere across the university, every student needs to learn about AI, and, and most of its fundamental form is chat. And the person that knows AI the best is going to hold down three or four jobs because they can do three or four jobs. And so the person that doesn't know technology at all is going to be left way far behind. And there's going to be people that aren't could possibly not work. Now this is way out of futuristic stuff. But what you ask is, I think what has to happen is every student needs to you know understand AI and how to use it as a tool. In, the, in their discipline and so they can apply it in their job. Don't, I, I'm not, I don't want to even talk about them, whether they're, they're uh, going to be um, uh, dis, um, they're not going to have a job. It's just that they must know how okay. AI is going to impact their discipline, whether it's chemistry or English or civil engineering, or um, some form, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions or comments? I can't think so. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. I, I, I think uh, that's all for, for us. Um, so I, I would like to conclude uh, this enriching lecture. Um, I, I like to express our deepest gratitude to Dr. Gardner for for your enlightening insights into the T professional model and its application in today's dynamic work environment. Your your detailed exploration of how technological disruption impact jobs and the critical skills required to navigate these changes are incredible, uh, in, incredibly valuable. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gardner, for sharing your vast knowledge and for the engaging discussion that arose from today's session. Your commitment to advancing the field of work integrated learning is truly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. Dr. You too. And again, I'm sorry. OK, for the delay. It is OK. It always happened. <laughs> it all, OK. Well, okay, I hope to see you in the future and maybe I'll be in Thailand. I haven't been there for a while, so it's time to come back. Oh, you are welcome. OK, bye <laughs> okay, bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah.